Welcome to the Iran This Week podcast with Art Keller for the week ending March 25th, 2011. Let's move right into this week's news about Iran. On 22 March, Bahrain complained to the Arabsat broadcaster over abuse and incitement on Iran's Arabic language Al Alam television, Hezbollah's Al Manar, and another Shiite channel, all of which are carried by Arabsat. Bahrain's political crisis has been the subject of a media war between pro-Iranian channels and Bahraini state television. Both have accused the other of incitement. Bahrain also condemned a protest outside the Saudi consulate in Tehran after reports Saturday that some 700 demonstrators broke windows and raised a Bahraini flag over the gate. Also on 22 March, Reuters reported that China was calling for a dialogue to resolve the international standoff over Iran's nuclear program. Reiterating its long-held position that Tehran is entitled to the peaceful use of nuclear energy, state news agency Xinhua reported on Wednesday. The very next day, 23 March, Reuters reported that Iran is under investigation for new attempts to import items from North Korea and China that are banned under UN sanctions against Tehran's nuclear and missile programs, UN diplomats said on Tuesday. The information emerged on the sidelines of a UN Security Council meeting to discuss a quarterly report on Iran's compliance with four rounds of UN Security Council sanctions imposed on Tehran for refusing to halt a nuclear enrichment program that Western powers fear is aimed at producing nuclear weapons. Last week on the podcast, I relayed news about Turkey searching an Iranian cargo plane, but the report at that time said nothing about what the cargo was or why Turkey was searching the plane. On 23 March, the Associated Press gave further details on the incident. Turkey says it seized the cargo of an Iranian plane bound for Syria because the shipment violated UN sanctions. The foreign ministry did not disclose the content of the seizure, but the UN sanctions against Iran ban the export of arms and prohibit nuclear enrichment. Turkish media said Wednesday the plane was carrying light weapons, including automatic rifles, rocket launchers, and mortars. On 24 March, the Associated Press reported that the regime in Tehran lashed out the decision by the UN's top human rights body to appoint a special investigator to look into allegations of human rights abuses in Iran, saying the newly created post is politically motivated and meant to divert attention from abuses in the United States. A spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry claim the vote at the Geneva-based UN Human Rights Council on Thursday came, quote, under U.S. pressure. The council narrowly approved a U.S. and Swedish-backed proposal for a special investigator for the Islamic Republic. The decision marks the first time since the Geneva-based council's creation in 2006 that a new position for a country-specific investigator was created for a UN member rather than merely extending the mandate of a previously existing one. And now on to questions and commentary from the desk of Art Keller, this week featuring a discussion with David Lewis. Last week I noted how China's willingness to pander to the current regime in Iran to secure access to Iranian oil meant that China's bad behavior was creating a big gap in the multilateral sanctions against Iran. As if to prove my point, this week China's government called for a, quote, dialogue on Iran's nuclear program, a call which was followed the next day by news that Iran is in trouble yet again for trying to buy restricted materials for their nuclear program from China. You really have to hand it to China. They're quite consistent in their willingness to ignore any level of international pressure or opinion and sell Iran's regime almost whatever it wants to boot, all as part of China's ongoing quest to get their mitts on Iran's oil. One of the most interesting things going on this week is the unrest in Syria. While political turmoil has been sweeping North Africa and the Middle East, unrest in Syria has far greater potential implications for Iran than any unrest in Egypt, Libya, or Bahrain ever could. Until recently, the political leadership in Tehran has been quick to gloat over the spate of uprisings, which for some reason they've viewed as a stick in the eye to the U.S. But they've been notably silent about the discord in neighboring Syria, and for good reason. Syria is a long-time Iranian ally, and if there's one thing that the regime in Syria and Iran's regime have in common, it's a willingness to resort to repressive tactics to stifle protest and quash any legitimate opposition. But if the Assad regime finds itself in real trouble, that example is more likely than any other to reignite the discontent that has smoldered in Iran ever since the dubious 2009 presidential elections. 
Syria has also helped funnel Iranian aid and influence to the terrorist group Hezbollah that holds so much power in Lebanon. So trouble in Syria, if it becomes serious enough, could also affect Iran's proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah. Even if Syrian President Bashar al-Assad successfully tamps down the discontent this time around, the instability in Alawite-ruled Syria has got to be making the Ayatollahs of Iran more than a little nervous. Please send your questions or comments about how Syria's troubles might affect Iran to Iran This Week at artkeller.com. Next up on the podcast, an interview with filmmaker David Lewis. Joining me on the podcast is David Lewis. He's a documentary filmmaker who's worked with a variety of major news outlets, including CNN, ABC, CBS, and PBS. His work for PBS included an episode of Frontline about Hezbollah. David is also the host of Conversations with David Lewis on AM 1690 in Atlanta. I'm having you on explicitly to, uh, to help explain how Iran and their influence kind of plays out in Lebanon, in Hezbollah. You had the unusual opportunity of getting to interview in, in person the spiritual head or a person who's commonly identified as a spiritual head, Grand Ayatollah Saeed Hassan uh, Fadlallah. How do you go about setting up such an interview? Oh, you call 1-800-Hezbollah, you, <laughs> uh, you ask for the spiritual leader, and it's all set up. No, I mean, you know, it's, it's like your old game. You start with a source, uh, you know, who leads you to one person, who leads you to another. You build up confidence, and eventually somebody says yes or no. In the case of Fadlala, he was relatively willing to, to meet with Americans. And I actually... Uh, you know, I, I interviewed him when I did the film for his for Frontline back in 2001, and then I saw him again summer before last when I took a group of Americans to Lebanon. And one of the things we did is we had about an hour with with the Grand Ayatollah, which was really interesting. How has the nature of Hezbollah like evolved or changed in, in Iranian influence on Hezbollah since the Hariri assassination? It's one of those things which is, you know, those who truly know don't say, and those who say don't know. Um, <laughs> the, the ultimate question with Hezbollah is always, in the end, if forced to make a choice between are we a Lebanese movement or are we a Iranian proxy, no one knows what the answer to that is. And clearly, Iran has a huge influence. I mean, you know, there's a go-between Iran and Hezbollah who sits on the Hezbollah Shura Council, a chap whose name escapes me, who, who lives out in Baalbek, in the Baalbek area of the Beka. Exactly what the relationship is, is, is unknown to outsiders, especially Americans. But, you know, the, the Hariri assassination has certainly put Hezbollah in the hot spot. Indictments are expected very soon. Well, there's also rumored to be indictments of, of Hamanai, the Iranian spiritual leader. I mean, you know, the, the, the boss of bosses, the, the, the capo de tutti capi in, in Iran. So we'll see if some of these details get fleshed out in the, in the tribunal investigation and indictments uh, uh, related to the Hariri murder. Don't know if that helps you, but that, that's, that's what I know. <laughs> it reminds me of something, the director of Syriana, I know you know Bob Bear, who's the author, who's, whose book was uh, loosely formed as a basis. There was a director giving an interview on NPR, and he said, if you see the movie and you're confused at the end, then that means you understood it. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, and I thought, wow, that, that was a really apt description. And, and I, for one, would like to know, is it even possible? How do you separate out the influence of Syria and Iran on Hezbollah? I think you can separate it out in, in a couple of ways. One, the Syrians, it's more of a, a marriage of convenience. I mean, there, Hezbollah is very useful as a foil against Israel. You don't get the sense that there's any great spiritual, ethnic, religious connection. I mean, you know, the, the Syrians are mostly Sunni, the, the leadership the Assad family and the main leaders are Alawites, which is, a, you know, another Muslim offshoot. While Iran, I mean, the, 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 they tried to export their revolution to other parts of the Arab world. The first place they tried was Lebanon, and it's basically the only place where they really succeeded. It's, you know, the, the, the Shiite population there, uh, better or worse, probably 90 percent of them are, or 95 percent of them are, are supporters of Hezbollah. So the connections there are religious, they're ethnic, they're tribal, and then they're also logistical, military, terrorist, financial. But with Syria, you know, you get the sense that if they thought it was in their interest, 
that to to sever the relationship with Hezbollah if they do a peace deal with Israel, God willing, inshallah, that would be a card that they would be willing to trade in. Right now, it's a useful card, but you could foresee the possibility that it's more useful to throw that card into the deck again. Recent news about Bahrain has been saying that the Bahrainis have been objecting to Iranian influence there. And I, I think the, the subtext being that, uh, hey, you're not going to turn us into Lebanon here. Just based on what you know of the way Hezbollah and Iranian influence works, do you think that's a, are they just playing another game and, and lobbying those accusations to divert public opinion in their country? Or is, or is that a legitimate complaint there that Iran's really meddling in Bahrain? You know, again, uh, you know, I don't have any access to intelligence materials. I don't know. But clearly, the Gulf countries, especially Bahrain, think so. I mean, today, I saw in the Beirut dailies, and then I saw it elsewhere, that Bahrain and the other Gulf countries are planning on throwing out any Shiites they suspect of being connected to Iran or Hezbollah, that they're going to kick them out of those countries. You know, that could be quite a lot of people. So clearly, they think so. I love that that footage. I just watched your front line before giving you a ring. And it was it was almost surreal to see them have the, the Lebanese Independence Day and have them playing the theme from Monty Python. <laughs> Did they not understand that they're self-parodying or... What was no, going on with that? <laughs> no, no, no. They had no idea. I mean, it was, you know, it was like the retired brigades. It was the old fat guys from the military. I mean, the whole event was so surreal. You know, they had about four or six helicopters who kept kind of circling around like those old Soviet days where they had one bomber that kept circling to make it look like there were lots more. And they had, I mean, it was just so absurd. I mean, they had the foreign dignitaries were invited, the press were invited, the heads of all the different religious factions were invited. The only people that weren't invited to the Independence Day celebrations were the actual people of Lebanon. I mean, you know, the, only the leaders got to celebrate independence. You know, no citizens were welcome. I mean, it was just a totally absurd event. Yeah, that certainly came across well in your piece. Going back to uh, uh, Syriana, I did find that movie fascinating. Of course, it's it's markedly different than the book it was based on. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, I thought it was a, a great movie. What did you think about it in, in terms of the way it portrayed things? Accurate, inaccurate? Obviously, it's, it wasn't in Bob's hands. Once you sell the script, what's done with it is up to the filmmaker. I got to say, I greatly enjoyed seeing Bob. Bob was a 20-plus year Middle East CIA veteran, and George Clooney plays a a 20-year Middle East CIA veteran named Bob. So, you know, uh, Bob Bear is a friend of probably close to 15 years. Uh, not quite that, but it was highly amusing to to see it. I read the book actually originally in galley form, so so it was really fun to, to see it, it inspire that movie. You know, there was a lot of great stuff in there. The recruiting of jihadis amongst the dispirited immigrant communities in the rich Gulf countries. I mean, there were some tremendous elements, you know, the, the connections between the rich royal family and American business. I mean, there were just, there were so many intriguing elements in that story. Uh, I mean, I, I greatly enjoyed the film. Again, it's sort of like one of those Bogart movies where you can never, like The Big Sleep, you can never figure out how all the pieces tie together. But I greatly enjoyed seeing so many themes about the, you know, the petrodollar and so many elements that are part of this tangled relationship America has with the Middle East brought out in that film. And I think for most viewers of that film, you know, it was it was all pretty new stuff. Definitely. And you know, I'm told it, it didn't do great at the box office, and I think that could be because it's a, it was a little bit too complex for the American mainstream viewer. I honestly think it makes people's brains hurt a little bit, and that, that's not necessarily the typical movie-going experience that people are looking at. But I was interested in, in Bob's character. You know, when he went back there, he basically had to get a, a nod from Hezbollah to operate in, in Lebanon. How much of that? do you think was kind of authentic? 